Welcome back and thank you for staying with us in case you're just joining us. Well, you're in time for the second interview that we had lined up for you as we mark the end of this uh, month of January. Actually, yesterday, the 30th of uh, January, uh, we it is a time when the world just, uh, you know, joins uh, together to mark um, the uh, the World Na Neglected Tropical Diseases Day. Actually, this is the fifth annual World Neglected Tropical Diseases Day. And this is actually a moment for us to really take a scorecard and look at the journey and what we have been able to do as a country, as a continent, as a globe uh, in addressing uh, some of these forgotten diseases that continue to be a burden to a very important segment of the population. And I just want to run you through what was happening in our country. The Ministry of Health has launched the 2023-2027 Master Plan to eliminate at least 20 neglected tropical diseases in the country. Speaking in Mombasa while marking this year's World Neglected Tropical Diseases, Acting Ministry of Health Director General says, by eradicated neglected diseases, the country will achieve one of the key sustainable development goals of ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being for all. However, lack of sufficient funds poses as the major threat as the country need more than 80 billion shillings to execute the plan. The government is now appealing on companies and well-wishers and philanthropists to align to the CSR in order to assist in the government in achieving this particular goal by the year 2027. Hata kama ni matende utapata hapa mkoa wa Pwani. Kama ni minyo utapata hapa hapa mkoa wa Pwani. Kichocho iko hapa. Chikungunya hii ndio headquarter ya Chikungunya hapa Kenya. Ukienda ugonjwa wa dengi unapata hapa hapa ugonjwa wote utaupata hapa neglected tropical diseases nafikiri ile peke yake ambayo hakuna ni ile ya trachoma lakini tumesema kwamba kwa huu mpango sasa tukishirikiana na serikali za county tunataka tubadilishe hiyo hiyo sura ili hapa kuwe hakuna ugonjwa wote wa neglected tropical diseases ifikiapo mwaka wa 2030 Indeed, that is Dr. Sultani Matendechero, who is uh, heading uh, the program for eliminating the tropical dis neglected tropical diseases at the Ministry of Health. And of course, we are going to be shedding some light on what he has just highlighted as the journey that the country is currently taking in changing the narrative. And uh, joining me in studio to have this very important conversation this morning, I'm joined by Dr. Bona Nyaoke. Since last year, she has been heading the mycetoma disease disease department at the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative. She's a clinical researcher and a public health specialist and also a medical doctor by profession at each profile that if I had time, I would delve into. But thank you for creating time thank for you. us. All right. So we just marked the annual World Neglected Tropical Diseases Day. And as a country, we had a lot of conversation revolving around even what you've heard Dr. Tari there talking about. How do we best address this particular group of diseases that have been forgotten. And maybe to start us off, just, um, you know, tell us a bit about what you think stood out for you in this fifth, um, you know, uh, celebration or, you know, marking of the, uh, you know, World Neglected Tropical Diseases Day. What should be the most important clarion call from, from where you sit? I think uh, the most important aspect that we can raise from this particular World NTD Day has been the theme, which is Act Now, Act Together. And uh, that has been the biggest issue with neglected tropical diseases in terms that since it's a neglected disease, we find small pockets of people doing some very good work, but in silos. This prevents uh, some of the work that has actually been done to be able to progress much more rapidly. So we do hope uh, right now as we increase the advocacy on neglected tropical diseases, as we understand the diseases better, as we have more 
champions as we have more partners and collaborators who are actually interested in working in neglected tropical diseases, we can actually be able to proceed and find treatments and also prevent these diseases in our communities. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, we want to talk about just making it as basic as possible because today it's all about um, you know, helping the public understand. We say they are forgotten. We say there's a lack of information about them. So this category of diseases, when we say neglected tropical diseases, mm -hmm. um, in simple language, how would you best describe them for somebody who wants to understand what they are? Okay, so we usually define neglected tropical diseases as diseases which are found uh, within the tropical areas, uh, a lot of sub-Saharan Africa, all the way from Latin America to uh, Asia. Um, why we call them neglected is because we tend to find them in our poor communities, mm -hmm. our rural communities, what we call our neglected uh, communities. Mm -hmm. We'll find other tropical diseases such as malaria, which are quite known you find that we have quite a lot of research and development uh, being done on them, yeah. and there's quite a lot of funding. Then we go to neglected tropical diseases. When we talk about diseases such as mycetoma, mm -hmm. leishmaniasis, mm -hmm. I'm sure those are yeah, some of the, the diseases you've not even heard of. Elephantiasis. Yes, exactly. So we call them neglected because we are not paying attention to them because of the people it affects. Mm -hmm. So it's more of a neglected population. So it's not about... Um, neglecting them because of the impact they have, but because of the population. Exactly. They're just as bad. Exactly. As, yeah. Because we tend to confuse it with other diseases such as rare diseases, where we say uh, they're not seen quite a lot or they're not there quite a lot. But neglected tropical diseases, we actually have quite a huge number of people who are affected by them. But since the population is neglected, we do not pay attention to it. Mm. And that is why we have to put a bit more advocacy to this particular population to ensure that we can be able to work on the disease. Mm -hmm. And just because you've said that, let me run you through some numbers from the World Health Organization. They single out three key issues about neglected tropical diseases. They say it affects 1 billion people around the world and 1.62 billion people require treatment. And of course, uh, we report about 200,000 deaths that can actually be prevented. This is according to WHO. We are looking at the global numbers. But Dr. Ari, I want, us to, I want you to bring us home in the Kenyan context. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about the burden of NTDs, how, what are we looking at? How bad is it? Yes, so going back uh, to what I was mentioning in terms of this is not a rare disease, yeah. this is not a disease that um, we should be forgetting, is because, as you mentioned, the population that is affected by NTDs is quite a lot, yeah. over 1.7 billion in the world. And we do know that 40% of this population is in Africa. Mm -hmm. That is around 700 million. If we break it down to Kenya, we come to around 25 million mm -hmm. people within Kenya who have actually been affected by a neglected tropical disease. If you look at the population of Kenya, this is almost half. Almost half. Yes. But if we are looking also at where these populations are based, we know that quite a lot of the development that we have within our country, mm -hmm. of course, are within the urban areas. If we go back to our rural areas, we have decreased uh, healthcare facilities. We do not have access to safe water for drinking. We do not have uh, good hygiene. So we have quite a number of these populations actually being affected by these diseases. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is there something unique about this population that is most vulnerable? Because you've talked about Africa, mm -hmm. you know, bearing the biggest burden, about 40%. Yes. I've also come across reports that, uh, you know, and even you have confirmed it, that uh, the poor population, uh, those who are in disturbed areas, like uh, areas that have conflict, mm -hmm. those who are in the, the poor, the poor urban population are the most affected. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything unique that ties this population to the vulnerability of being affected by um, NTDs? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, unfortunately, NTDs are what we call disease of poverty. Poverty, mm -hmm. because we find uh, most of the population who are affected by the disease tend to repeat the poverty cycle. Because if you have a disease that is slow growing, can actually result in death, decreases your quality of life, you're not able to have a proper education. You're not able to work. You're not able to help your community. So if you find a community that is affected, like if you go to West 
Pokot, where there are high cases of uh, visceral leishmaniasis, mm -hmm. and you find uh, young children dying from the disease, or you're finding uh, the adult population not being able to work, it means they cannot take care of their families. It means that uh, we do not have the literacy rates going up. So the disease keeps on multiplying within that particular community. And since they do not have the proper access to healthcare, then this keeps on perpetuating within the same area. Mm -hmm. I know there are about 20 one, there are about types of uh, these diseases. But then again, um, what cuts across in terms of the common causes, the unique um, symptoms that, you know, probably they present that you'd say are key, that these are the things we should be focusing on? Because it's all about awareness. We are yes. Unfortunately, we lump them as neglected tropical diseases as one group, yeah. but they're actually very diverse. Yeah. The common denominator is that it is a disease of poverty that we occurs in poor communities in rural areas. But the diseases can be caused by bacteria, by viruses, by fungi. Mm -hmm. And they also present quite differently. Because I think the common one that we tend to know things like elephantiasis, where you find the leg is quite swollen, it takes quite a bit of time for the swelling to occur. Uh, mycetoma, which is another neglected tropical disease, you'll find that you start with a small thorn prick, then the leg also enlarges, but you have like a, a kind of a until composition. If you look at dengue or chikungunya, they present like malaria, where within three to seven days, you have the patient actually presenting with fever, chills, mm -hmm. uh, joint and muscle pains. So they do not have a similar, if I may say, uh, form of presentation. So awareness is not only even for the patients who are within these particular communities, but also within the physicians and the healthcare practitioners. Because I usually tell quite a number of people, personally, apart from medical school, mm -hmm. where I actually saw mycetoma within our pathology reports, mm -hmm. I never encountered a patient Before. with mycetoma mm -hmm. until I joined Drugs for Neglected Diseases. Mm -hmm. That does not mean we do not have patients with mycetoma in Kenya, which we noted uh, in our last trip where we did a medical camp in West Pokot County, mm -hmm. where we found that we actually have patients with mycetoma. Mm -hmm. So it's the patients knowing what diseases they have, the healthcare practitioners being able to diagnose and detect these particular diseases. Because as mentioned, we tend to concentrate on the diseases which are around us, uh, where you or any other person who has the means is able to come to the hospital mm -hmm. and seek for treatment. Mm -hmm. But we have those ones within our borders, within the conflict zones, who are affected by these neglected tropical diseases, but do not have access to healthcare. To healthcare. Do you think it's a big problem, um, you know, uh, the, the, the lack of awareness on the side of the healthcare providers? I've had reports of uh, misdiagnosis. You know, you go to hospital the very first time you're told, maybe it could be malaria, and then you, you're given drugs. Take some time, you go back. By the time they realize what the problem is, mm -hmm. it has taken... Um, you know, longer than it should have. Um, what is it that you are doing or the country is currently doing in terms of just ensuring that even as we create awareness on the side of the public and even as the government tries to put up the resources and everything that's needed, mm -hmm. the healthcare workers are also aware of what is it that we are looking at. So education, yeah. that definitely is the biggest aspect. Uh, DNDI, what we're doing specifically in Sudan, where we were conducting a clinical trial on mycetoma, we did realize that most of the physicians could not diagnose mycetoma. Mm -hmm. So we worked very closely with the Mycetoma Research Center based in Khartoum, uh, unfortunately before the political conflict that is currently ongoing. And we were able to provide like pre-screening, then uh, confirmation of this disease, then like an assessment afterwards. And we found that a lot of physicians uh, would actually think of mycetoma as a cancer because on how it actually affects the muscles and the tissues and the bones. So they were not able to diagnose it properly. Mm -hmm. So education was able to be applied to them. Coming back here to Kenya, uh, we see that the Ministry of Health has made it uh, quite difficult for patients to be able to access things like anti-malarials. Mm -hmm. Because we now know that every fever, joint pain, or uh, muscle pain that you experience is not because of malaria. It could be dengue, it could be chikungunya. Mm -hmm. So you need to actually confirm what uh, infection you have and be able to treat the right infection. Mm -hmm. And this uh, is done by, apart from providing the community awareness, is also actually going to the hospitals, healthcare practitioners, pharmacists, and informing them that these other diseases exist. 
these are the symptoms which could mimic the malaria and how we can go about treating them. All right. I'll take you back to something you just mentioned because I find it sort of like a milestone. Mm -hmm. um, you managed the first ever clinical trial for a new treatment for mycetoma. Mm -hmm. This is where you said in, yes. in Sudan. Yes. Let us understand a bit more about this project, what, what inspired it, mm -hmm. and what are we looking at in terms of the promise that it has? Yeah. So um, I usually say my setoma because it's my baby <laughs> within the organization. Yeah. We usually call it, uh, we have neglected tropical diseases. We call it even neglected of the neglected tropical diseases uh -huh. because my setoma is not a new disease. Uh, referred to as Madura foot in Sudan or India, it was first detected around the 1800s. But mm. up till today, we do not have new treatments for mycetoma. The current treatment available is an antifungal called itraconazole, mm -hmm. where it involves the patient taking two tablets twice a day, every single day, for a period of one year. Mm -hmm. So for any person who takes antibiotics for five to seven days, you know how difficult yeah, it is. Yeah. Now imagine doing that for 12 months. Yes. Wow. And you still have uh, the cure rates being quite low and you have these patients actually having uh, recurrences of the disease and they have to be amputated because, as I mentioned, it grows as a very big mass and uh, it uh, goes into your muscle and into your bone and you're not able to be mobile. So they have to amputate that part. Mm -hmm. So they'll amputate your foot where you have the infection, amputate your knee, then it reaches a point they can't ap amputate you anymore. So at that point, usually the patient dies. Mm -hmm. So we were very fortunate to be able to collaborate uh, with Ezai Pharmaceuticals. This is a pharmaceutical company based in Japan, together with the Mycetoma Research Center, where we started our clinical trial in uh, 2017. Mm -hmm. And within that, we were able to use a drug from Ezai called Fosravuconazole. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still taken for 12 months, but you only need to take it once a week. So oh, that was a definite a improvement from six days. Exactly. Uh, once a week and of course, uh, uh, one time. And uh, the other advantages uh, for the itraconazole that was there before, it had to be taken twice a day, but you had to have it with a full meal. Mm -hmm. Like when you go to the doctor and they say, you need to take this after a meal. Mm -hmm. Remember, we're talking about these poor populations. Uh, making them look for two meals a day, first of all, you know it's quite difficult for them. And then it had quite a lot of side effects, such as liver effects and all that. The drug before that, uh, called ketoconazole, was actually banned in the USA mm -hmm. because patients were dying from the drug rather than the disease mm -hmm. because of the liver toxicity mm -hmm. that was being caused. Mm -hmm. So the fosravuconazole was a game changer for all of us because, uh, as mentioned, apart from the advantages of the once weekly dosing and it being safer, uh, we also found it had very good cure rates. Mm -hmm. So we were able to go to the regulatory authority in Sudan and present this clinical trial data to them. And we are actually working on the registration of this drug in Sudan mm. and so hopefully to other countries. Yeah, that's why I, I was almost asking, is, mm. has it been approved already? Is it already? So unfortunately with the political situation in Sudan, <laughs> this has been quite delayed. Mm -hmm. We started on that last year. We had hoped by this year we would be registered, but it seems we'll experience a bit of a delay on that. All right, mm -hmm. but you know, what you've mentioned is really quite a major problem when it comes to the neglected tropical diseases. One thing they share in common is that um, they, uh, they don't have uh, the funding that is required. Mm -hmm. The drugs are also not available mm -hmm. most of, for, for a majority of these diseases. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at pharmaceutical developments, the, the, the shift is skewed towards where the money is. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and you're talking about the poor population yes. here. Any person who has a business mind would think there's right. no money in this side. So mm -hmm. let's, let's begin to innovate and develop drugs that, you know, we can sell to people who have the money. Yeah. How do we change this narrative? That's where DNA so drugs, comes in. Yeah. Yes, yeah. we come in as the middleman because we do understand a pharmaceutical company, their main objective is to make money. A clinical trial or any research and development work can last between 10 to 20 years. Mm -hmm. So developing and working on this particular drug where in the end you understand the patients may not be able to afford it and you have to give it for free does not make any economical sense for mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. So DNDI comes in, in in terms of we are able to source for funding to be able to conduct these clinical trials from donors. Then we go to the pharmaceutical companies who are producing the molecules. Mm -hmm. And with them, we can be able to uh, have this conversation 
that we will take on the financial burden of conducting this clinical trial with your molecule. But when we do find that we are able to uh, uh, find that its cure rates are quite good, then we, we do share, what can I say, the glory of the, of the new molecule. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, uh, we are able to talk to the ministries of health within the different countries, ensure that there's access, uh, work with the World Health Organization, ensure that these drugs are put in the essential medicine list. So you might not get the profit that you would have gotten maybe with the uh, cancer medicine or any other viral uh, medicine like COVID, what we saw, mm -hmm. but we do understand that you're able to make a bigger contribution to global health without going through the financial burden that would uh, that you'd have to go in working on an NTD. Mm -hmm. So a uh, very good example was our collaborations that we did on sleeping sickness in DRC with Sanofi. And we, ca we were able to see that we were able to provide a drug that is oral. Initially, patients had to receive intravenous drug. The patients used to say when they were injected, they used to feel fire mm -hmm. in their veins. Mm -hmm. And of course, when somebody tells you that, you know, tomorrow you won't see them again mm -hmm. because they won't come for the yeah. uh, medications. And then they have to go to a very far off place because you have to be in hospital. Yeah. Right now, the healthcare practitioners are able to go to the rural areas, diagnose them and give them the oral drug for them to take at home. Mm -hmm. So we've seen there's quite a big improvement within the country. Mm -hmm. You've talked about Sudan. And the other drug as well for sleeping sickness? Uh, Fexinidazole. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Kenya, are we, do we have any stories to write home about? Yes. Any developments? Yeah, tell yes. us more we about the We have very good news, yeah. especially for our visceral leishmaniasis uh, project. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been running some clinical trials in West Pokot County in Kachiliba District Hospital. And we've been able to get uh, some new treatments, also the same. Uh, patients had to go for weeks on intravenous or intramuscular, have to go to the hospital to be injected for these medications. And we've been able to find some very good oral combination uh, regimens, uh, miltephosine and paramomycin, which are some of the drugs that are currently being used. Uh, we've been able to go to the ministries of health within Kenya, and these have also been added within our national guidelines and are current treatments being provided for patients there. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the role of um, the leaders and the community in making you know this journey easier and for us to really achieve our targets much mm -hmm. easier mm -hmm. because i was looking at what who is saying that about 50 countries have been able to eliminate um, at least a neglected tropical disease mm -hmm. the good news is that among those 20 over 20 countries mm -hmm. are from this side of the world. Yes. Um, Kenya, Senegal are some of the examples of the countries that actually are doing well. Mm -hmm. But for us to sustain this momentum, it will take something. Somebody has to do something. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to play a role. Mm -hmm. Who are the critical players that you're looking at and what should each and every person do for us to really move faster mm -hmm. if we are to achieve this target? Yes, uh, because definitely that has uh, taken quite a bit of time because we have out of the 21 NTDs, mm -hmm. at least 16 are in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And uh, as of now, I believe we've only been able to eradicate Guinea worm. Mm. So we still have quite a long way to go, but uh, it's involvement of the stakeholders. Stakeholders start right from the community. Whenever we start any clinical trial or work on any area, we go to who are the leaders within this community? Who are the people of influence? Because uh, before I go and find that child with visceral leishmaniasis, before I find that uh, adult with mycetoma, they needs to be the chief within the area, the district commissioner or the local uh, community health workers who is able to spread the word to them mm. that uh, you do not have to hide yourself because also NTDs are associated with a lot of stigma. Yeah. Because if you have a swelling from visceral leishmaniasis where the stomach of the child or the adult can grow quite big, the first thing, especially if you're in a rural area, is it's witchcraft. If you are in Sudan, the same thing. If your leg starts growing and looks like a huge yeah. until with grains falling out yeah. and pass, mm. you have to hide that person away because they assume that this person has been cast. Mm. So it is first getting the communities involved to, uh, to educate them that this is like malaria, this is like tuberculosis. If you go to the uh, doctor in your nearest clinic or you go to the next camp, this can actually be treated.
Then the next level, of course, is the education that I mentioned for our healthcare practitioners. Because, of course, we tend uh, to go with this uh, same saying that we from medical school, uh, what is more common is what is there. Mm. So, of course, if you see uh, uh, an animal that comes to you in Nairobi, mm -hmm. you will not think of maybe Nairobi Hospital, a zebra. You will think maybe of a donkey in your, if you're in Lumuru. True. Yes. So we need to be able to um, educate more of the healthcare uh, practitioners practitioners of what is required of them and how to be able to diagnose and treat these particular diseases. Mm -hmm. Then our ministries of health, we've been able to have quite a lot of uh, progress within this because we have the NTD uh, directors, we have focal points who actually work very closely with the World Health Organization to make sure that the NTD roadmap is actually followed. Mm -hmm. I actually attended a meeting in uh, Congo Brazzaville a few months ago where we were looking at the midterm uh, strategic review. And uh, part of the data that com came from that meeting was knowing that quite a number of African countries have actually been able to eliminate some NTDs. And this is putting our governments accountable because you cannot say you will eliminate 20 by 2030 and it's already 2025 mm. and you've only eliminated one. one. What exactly are you doing to ensure yeah, that yeah. you're able to meet your goals yeah. and where can you get the support? No, and I said, how do we move faster? Exactly. Because we had even the Deputy Director General, Dr. Maten, Matende Chero, they are saying that we actually need to really re-energize and do something about mm. us yeah. eliminating the neglected tropical diseases. But then again, how do we move faster? Yes. That's the bigger question. Yeah. And, you know, having a majority of um, quite a number of African countries eliminated at least yeah. uh, one, um, you know, or two uh, neglected tropical diseases. Do you think, you know, the cross-border learning and uh, sharing of experience can, can help? Because if we have been able to eliminate one type of mm. a tropic, neglected tropical disease, mm -hmm. our neighbors have managed, mm -hmm. you know, another time. One, yes. I mean, talk to us, is it already working or is it yes, something it that, is. Yeah? it is, because we saw even within that meeting, they were forming some working groups. Yeah. If I'm able to uh, get rid of guinea worm, we have another country that has gotten rid of visceral leishmaniasis. Yeah. We are all kind of like a village what methods did you use in your particular exactly. country mm -hmm. that we can be able to apply? And we see some of those conversations already happening and are continuing. Another part is the advocacy, because just having that world and TDD, having me here today talking about neglected tropical diseases, we are slowly removing that neglected part of the disease yeah. because we have more people aware of these particular diseases. Oh. And what that helps with is we are able to get more funding Funding assists us to be able to conduct research and development. It assists us to be able to uh, conduct preventative measures uh, for these particular patients and also to increase All advocacy. Right. All right. Yes. As we close this conversation, this year's theme is actually centered around uniting, unite, act and eliminate. As your parting shot, how do you, you know, internalize this clarion call? What does it mean for you as we close? Um, for me, neglected does not need to be there. We have tropical diseases. We see what we've been able to do with a disease like malaria. What it means is we have populations that we are neglecting. And uh, this comes into the whole universal health coverage and looking at the global health agenda. We need to ensure that we have populations within the world that are not neglected. This is ensuring our rural areas have access to healthcare facilities and have access to healthcare workers. We need to ensure our conflict zones, areas like Sudan right now, have uh, access to humanitarian aid. When we ensure populations are not neglected, we are able to remove the neglected out of the entities. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for creating time for us this morning. That was Dr. Bona Nyaoke, who heads um, the head of uh, mycetoma disease at the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative in the studio with us this morning just to talk about the neglected tropical diseases, the way forward and what need, needs to be done for us as a country to really realize our target of eliminating this group of diseases that continue to be a burden to um, a very important population in our country. My name is Safina Chengoma. Really thankful that you created time to join us for the show this morning. It's a wrap for us, but continue watching Citizen TV. We have a lot that we still have lined up for you. For now, have a lovely day ahead. <laughs>